So preparing for GDPR, uh, the code way and the I comply way with, with myself, Alex O'Neill. I am, uh, for those of you who've never seen me speak before, I'm Code's professional services manager. I'm head of uh, consultancy and compliance for Code. Uh, so I was involved in helping to, to draft these documents and uh, I've, I've probably spoken to quite a few of you on the phone lines, the more technical queries we've had around this. Um, so just moving on. So Code's position. Um, GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, is uh, it is it is a regulation. It's 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 uh, a written law that is open to interpretation. Uh, and at the moment, probably what you will see is there are different people, different compliance organisations as well, giving com slightly conflicting information. Um, so what I may tell you today may be slightly different from what you've heard. Uh, from somebody else or from some other compliance provider. It doesn't necessarily mean that we're right and they're wrong, it just means that this is our position on it currently and it will evolve. Um, what we'll see is obviously we'll see some case law probably over the next few years where people start trying to sue people or report them to the ICO or the ICO starts taking certain businesses to court and as this sort of goes along people will almost will, a consensus will come out over the next two years or so I would imagine on GDPR. Um, uh, however, you know, we've got a very solid starting position that I'm going to go through and I'm going to explain it to you uh, and I'm going to explain to you the documents that we have in code that help you and I comply. I'm going to give you a good overview of, of GDPR, why it's come around, what it's all about and how you can start dealing with it. I can't go too granular with it because there's a lot of information and there's quite a lot of things that you need to do. Um, what is the uh, you know the CQC's interpretation on this? As far as I'm aware, the CQC, like everybody else, is still trying to understand it. So I don't think the CQC are going to go very heavy on this in the next six to twelve months. But I'd imagine after six to twelve months, you'll start seeing this in CQC inspections. It's actually built into uh, the new key lines of inquiry that were published on the first of April that uh, everyone's interpreting and seeing what changes we need to make uh, at the moment. But there are key lines of inquiry that are do quite clearly sort of refer to GDPR concepts. So they will start looking at it at some point, um, uh, but I wouldn't worry about it too much. From an ICO perspective as well, just, just, just in case anybody thinks the ICO are gonna come and knock on your door, that's not going to happen. The ICO, unless someone reports a data breach or something happens, uh, then the ICO aren't going to come around and inspect you like the CQC. Now, you have to be compliant from May the 25th. So now is the time, if you've not started, now is the time to get ready. Uh, after May the 25th, if you're not compliant, then obviously if, if you get a data breach or something happens, then you could be investigated and you could be fined. Uh, a significant amount of money. I'm not going to go into all the, the fines and how that works. So obviously our advice is get prepared, get on top of it and start doing it now. And then obviously as GDPR evolves, you can kind of adjust and move along. Um, so what have I said there? We're going to be adding to our documents. So we are looking at, at contract clauses. Do we need to add joint controller? That Our, our contracts or our self-employed agreements are now with our um, our lawyers who are having a look at it and we're seeing what we need to do if anything around sort of joint controllers where employee privacy notices we're looking into whether we need to do that i don't think we do because i think our privacy notice quite clearly covers employees but it's been raised a couple of times so we're looking into that uh, the, the, the data protection act obviously we've got a data protection bill at the moment that is still being debated in parliament and the data protection bill takes uh, the GDPR and it ratifies it into English law and that will sort of almost take over from GDPR as the, the legal instrument that, that, that people are trying to comply with. Uh, now the data protection bill is still being debated so some of the references that you will see in documents for example say around lawful basis for pro bases for processing which we'll look at in a bit we'll have to update those references so do expect the code documents to involve and evolve and you to get further version numbers coming out uh, and the e-privacy regulations the e-privacy regulations kind of almost well, we have to comply with those and we have to comply with GDPR, which is causing some issues around legitimate interest, which I'll touch upon today, but I'm not going to go into great detail because the legitimate interest debate is a bit of a debate and uh, you just need to decide which way you, you sit on it. But that'll make more sense as we go along. 
so moving to the next side. So GDPR, uh, the General Data Protection Regulation. It's, it's from Europe. Uh, Brexit has no effect on this. We've already decided we're going to comply with it. And it comes into force, as I said, from May the 25th. Um, the Data Protection Act, as I said, is being updated. And we're going to see what comes out in that Data Protection Act. There's still a small hope that uh, they're going to reduce the uh, data protection officer requirement for, for NHS practices. Uh, not sure, we'll see, we'll see what comes out of that. Um, so, you know, what is this GDPR and, and what's it all about and where's it come from? I mean, for those of you who've been following the news and been aware of, say, the Cambridge Analytica and the Facebook case, these are the, the laws, I heard this quite well described on the news the other day, these are the laws we almost needed 10 years ago. Data, our data has become a commodity that can be sold, can be uh, understood, you know, and, and if you get different data sets together, you can find out things about people that necessarily they wouldn't want you to find out and they can and you can profile people and there's a lot of stuff that can be done with this data and obviously as we're going online uh, as you do any google search you do is tracked if you go on facebook they can see what you're doing on other sites it's big business i've got uh, two or three friends of mine who have who have left their jobs to go into big data because big data is is a is a massive growing field now the GDPR applies equally to a big company as it does to a small company, so we need to comply with those regulations as well. So it applies to data controllers. Uh, that's generally going to be us as businesses. Um, we'll look at the, those uh, definitions in a minute. It applies to data processors. Uh, those are generally people who work for us or third-party companies that are doing things on our behalf. Uh, and it applies to data subjects. And data subjects, from our perspective as dental practices, are our patients and our employees. So that's what we're looking at. Uh, as I said before, there are introductions of fines and they can be quite large. So you do want to make sure you're complying from May the 25th, but I don't think anyone's going to be knocking down your door to check on compliance. Um, and there are changes to breach notifications as well. I've just mentioned this here because it's not on a later slide. Uh, currently, technically under the Data Protection Act, you only have 24 hours to report a data breach. Uh, under, the, under the GDPR, you're gonna have 72 hours. So you've got a little bit longer to figure out what's actually happened, whether you need to report it and who you need to report it to. Do you need to report it to the data subject? There are sort of rules around that as well, which are, are in our documents if you've, uh, if you've got the code document. So moving on, so controllers and processors. Um, so, you know, it's probably important to, to understand what a data controller is and what a, a processor is. So a controller determines the purposes and the means of processing data. Um, so generally speaking, that's going to be you as uh, the company or there is a bone of contention here, which we'll touch on in a minute. Self-employed associates, hygienists, etc., depending on how you interpret the, the ICO guidance. Um, a processor is responsible for processing personal data on behalf of a Controller. So generally speaking, in, in codes interpretation, that's your employees and it's any third party companies you use to help you do your job, to help you deliver your service to patients. Uh, so what is data processing? I think it's a, a really sort of weird term because it, it means everything. So processing is collecting data, so getting medical histories filled out technically is data processing, uh, recording, using that data, organizing it, storing it, publishing it, deleting it, destroying it. These are all processing activities. Um, so a really good example would be, you know, if you were looking at your patient database and you were wanting to do direct marketing to some patients uh, and you were trying to figure out who you should send a whitening offer to. So you're actually sorting through your patient's data just to figure out how to market to them. And that would actually be a processing activity because you're then using that data to profile your patients or to look, to look at it. Um, and the, the bottom point is really, really important. This comes straight from GDPR and from the ICO guidance. You know, whenever, you're, whenever a controller uses a processor, it needs to have a written contract in place. So for your employees, you've already got that. You just need to make sure you've got confidentiality agreements and you've got the right clauses in place. Code contracts already have uh, these clauses in them and they're fine. Um, for any third party companies you use, and we'll come on to this, you need to have a written agreement in place and we've given you uh, the template for doing that. So, now that you understand what data processing is, 
uh, and I've explained to you where this GDPR is coming from, it's, it's mainly coming from a place that our data is, is a real commodity these days. It can be sold, it can be used to identify you, maybe in ways you don't want it to be able to identify you. Uh, so the GDPR is really in the spirit of minimizing data for the purpose it needs to be used for and giving the data subject real control over what can be done with that data and the right to have that data deleted or to object to use of that data. And we'll cover all of this as we're going along. So I'm gonna sort of cover the, the these points here of what uh, the GDPR principles are. And these come from Article 5 of GDPR and how that relates to maybe documents in the code system or, or the approach that you need to have with them. So first one is lawfulness, fairness, and transparency. It says that personal data should be processed lawfully. You need a legal lawful basis for processing someone's data. Now, there are different lawful bases that you're allowed to use within Article 6 slash Article 9 of the General Data Protection Regulation. I'll come on to those in a bit, but you need to have these things written down. And it's got to be in a transparent manner. So it needs to be transparent to your data subjects. So to your employees and to your patients, uh, you need to tell them exactly why you're collecting their data and what you're going to do with their data. And the way that you do this is through your privacy notice. Your privacy notice explains exactly what's been doing with this, uh, exactly what you're doing with this data, why you're doing it, and your lawful basis for processing data. Purpose limitation. Um, and obviously, sorry, transparency in there as well. So, so it has to be completely transparent. You can't be hiding anything or hiding any processes. Uh, so purpose limitation, personal data should be collected for specified, explicit and legitimate purposes. So on your privacy notice, or if you're gaining consent for marketing, which is obviously another point we'll come to later, then you need to, it needs to be very specific and explicit why you want this data. And obviously it needs to be legitimate. Uh, you couldn't be saying to somebody, oh, we're collecting your data because we're a dental practice and then selling it a mailing list to somebody else. Obviously we generally would never do that. Uh, so purpose limitation, obviously you, you should be using the data for the reason that you've collected it, not for other data. And that obviously needs to be transparent in your processes or your privacy notice. Data minimization. So, you know, the personal data should be adequate, relevant and limited to what is necessary. I think that's quite obvious. You, you don't, shouldn't retain more data than you need. Uh, accuracy, it needs to be accurate and it needs to be kept up to date. So, you know, you give the patients, you let patients know uh, that they can challenge the accuracy of the data, they can they have the right to correction of the data. Um, and uh, and obviously you need to make sure that your records are, are accurate, which we, I think we do anyway with medical history updates and forms and asking people to update their addresses. So where were we? Storage limitations. So personal data should be kept in a form which permits identification of the data subjects for no longer than is necessary uh, and for the purposes for which it is processed. So if you're doing, say, um, telephone recording is a really good example. So some of us record our calls. Uh, so why do we record our calls? That would be written in your privacy notice. We record our calls for quality assurance purposes. OK, well, how long do you need to retain that call data in order to do that job? So storage limitation, uh, I'm just giving you a specific example, but it's about making sure that you're keeping the data for as long as you need it and no longer. Um, this could, you know, the, the, there are things here where it can come into clinical records, but clinical records are subject to different rules or different guidelines anyway. So integrity and confidentiality, obviously it's about, you know, unlawful, unauthorized processing um, and accidental loss, destruction, damage, you know, so obviously making sure that your processes are very clear, people in your organization, only the right people have access to it. You know, if you're call, recording call data, uh, the, you know, your receptionist is, is being recorded every single day, probably shouldn't have the whole team having access to that recording. I know that seems really obvious, but, you know, say complaint data, does everyone need to have access to complaint data? And obviously making sure that you're, um, you're making sure that you're protecting against accidental loss, damage. So for example, I had a call on the lines last week that someone was asking me, was it okay that they were keeping their, their backup disc in their car door? And I said, that's probably not the best idea because that could easily be lost. It's not a secure way of sort of um, keeping that hard disk safe, as it were. Uh, and then accountability. All of this needs to be documented. Everything you're doing under GDPR needs to be completely transparent and documented. And if you see sort of the fairness one at the top, the fairness principle, as being in relation to 
the data subject and being transparent to the data subject. Accountability is about being transparent to the Information Commissioner's Office or the CQC or someone like that who's, uh, who's potentially investigating you and wanting to see what you've done. So everything needs to be documented and that's why we've got the, the, the action plan uh, in iComply and we've got the documents to help you meet the points in, those, in the action plan. GDPR compliance in a nutshell. Um, just trying to sort of go through the basic points. We're going to go through this more as we go along. Uh, but you need to make sure that controllers are registered. So obviously uh, there are different people are controllers. We're going to talk about that on, a, on another slide in a second, so I won't go into that. But all your controllers must be registered with the ICO. You need to identify how you collect and process data. So part of this is you know, understanding exactly what data you collect, what, so, what type of data it is, how you process it, identifying all your processing activities and documenting them. And then the same for, you know, how and where you store data because there are, you know, there are requirements for storage, whether it's inside the EU, outside the EU, we're gonna come across that on later slides as well. But you need to identify everything you do around data and understand it. So it's quite a good sort of starting point is to sort of map your information flows and to understand everything going inside and outside of your business and your internal processes around that as well and the types of data that you have, where you store them, how you process them, etc. And we've got documents in the system that you'll see that will help you do that. You need to identify where your data processors store data as well, whether it's inside the EU, outside the EU, and you need to respond to that accordingly. And we have advice around that, which I'm gonna cover in later slides. You need to establish lawful bases, bases uh, the plural of basis, uh, lawful bases uh, for processing within your documents. Um, and you need to sort of document that and establish for, for your processing activities what lawful basis you are using. Uh, data processors must have suitable agreements. Uh, you need to contract your data processors. Uh, make sure that they're all in contract. I mentioned that earlier for your employees that you're covered. Uh, for any third party companies you're using, you've got a model template, um, which again, I've got a slide on that in a bit, so we'll, we'll have a look at that. Mapping your information flows, sorry, mapping your information flows understanding and reducing risk. So how does, we're getting really interesting calls about this at the moment. So how do you receive referral information? How do you send referral information out? How do you contact your labs? What data do you give them? What comes back? So understanding all of these flows in and out of your business and understanding the risks around those. We've got a document exactly for, 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 for looking at this stuff understanding your risks around those and then trying to reduce those risks and introduce privacy by design. So, for example, encryption on referrals. I think pretty much everyone was doing this already, but a lot of you are now looking how to encrypt and how to deal with your data in that way. Uh, introducing pseudonymization, uh, a word that took me about a day to learn how to pronounce. <laughs> so if anyone else is having that battle at the moment, uh, you, can, you, can, you will be able to pronounce that word one day. Uh, but, you know, do you need to send your labs the full name and the date of birth of your patients, or could you pseudonymize it? Or could you send them reference codes from exact or something like that? So looking at all of your data flows, uh, I had a call earlier from a practice who I think's on this, this and I'm sure who's on this webinar now, and I, I, I'm sure they won't mind me mentioning it, but in that practice, uh, they are using mobile phones to sort of send data via WhatsApp to their, to their dentist about what's in the day list tomorrow and what patients they're seeing. and. And my question was, well, is that necessary? Uh, having run referral practices, I don't know if you actually, if that's a necessary, it's nice and it's convenient, but is it really necessary for treating that patient? So looking at all of these things and what you do is mapping your information flows, understanding, reducing risk, adding privacy by design. Um, I'm, I'm coming across, I'm, someone's just said about the ICO, I'm coming onto that point on the, I think it's the next slide. So. Uh, gain consent if and where required. We'll talk about this later. Uh, consent is one of the lawful bases you can use for processing. Uh, we're recommending it for certain reasons rather than say legitimate interests for marketing. Uh, and I'll, I'll touch upon why, but this is a, a point of contention on GDPR. Some people are saying you can use legitimate interests for marketing. Some people are saying you can't. We're sort of saying it's probably best not to right now, but we've actually given you tools that you can use to, uh, for legitimate interests if you want to use legitimate interests. 
uh, there's a reason why we're advising not, and I can point you to a, to a very useful webinar that's going to explain that to you. Um, maintain your records. Everything needs to be documented, as we said, uh, and you need to keep that up to date. Publish your privacy notice. Obviously, you have a requirement to be transparent, and you need to publish your, your privacy notice. And then manage and review annually. You know, Review your consent, review who has, has given you consent. Hopefully, your software systems, if I was in practice right now, I would hope that my software system provider is going to give me a nice way to manage my consent. Uh, if they're not, I would maybe be looking to switch software providers. Now, I know that's probably quite controversial, but I think it's a quite a big thing is managing this communication consent, um, specifically around marketing, uh, less so around um, other things. But Right, so are you a data controller? I'm not going to read this slide point by point. Um, the, where the bone of contention is on this slide is on, on point four. If a complaint was made by a patient or data was lost, would you be legally responsible for dealing with the matter? Now, our advice for code is that looking at those four points from the data from the, um, the ICO, um, you, sorry, looking at those four points, this is who we've determined should register. And I'm, I won't read through all of them, but you can see the points there on the slide. And it's very clear you know, a limited company needs to have a registration unless it's just for tax purposes, in, in which case it's basically an individual anyway, so they should probably register. You know, uh, clinicians who are working uh, in more than one practice, slightly greyer area, uh, but, you know, partnerships should have a registration under the partnership name, or if it's an expense sharing partnership, each partner, single-handed uh, practice owners are very straightforward. Where it becomes a little bit greyer is on that last point, which is expense sharing partners, self-employed associates, hygienists, therapists. Um, this is a bone of contention. It's open to interpretation uh, because there are scenarios where they would be legally responsible for dealing with a complaint, and there are scenarios where um, they could breach, they could personally breach data not following your processes. So it's completely up to you as a practice to decide which way you go on this. So moving on, data types. So the, the, the General Data Protection Regulation defines two categories, as it were, of data. You've got personal data, which means information relating to an identifiable person who can be directly or indirectly identified. So personal data, you know, name, email address, things like that. You know, stuff you'd use for marketing as well. Um, and then special category data, uh, is similar to what's sensitive data under the current Data Protection Act, uh, but it includes that list of bullets we've got there. But obviously for us, uh, data concerning health, sex life, sexual orientation, these are all things that we have. You know, we have people's clinical records. Uh, we may know their sexual orientation through their medical histories or their sex life if they've declared certain things to us. So I doubt we'd know their political opinions or religious or, well, we may know religious belief. Um, because that can be relevant for, for clinical data. So obviously we are handling both types of data. Personal data we're handling for our employees, uh, for anybody that we are directly marketing to who isn't a current patient. So for example, if we've put up a, a guide on our website and asked someone to give email addresses to download that guide or to access a, a blog post or something, and then we're using that for marketing, they're not yet a patient, but we have their personal data. And we need to obviously have uh, sort of strict uh, control around that and obviously processes and etc around that. Special category data is obviously our clinical records. Um, Debbie, our advice at Code is that self-employed GDPs should register as data, data controllers with the ICO. Not, you, do, you don't need to register as a data processor, so I just picked that one up. So that is our advice at Code. Um, so in order to process data, uh, going back to you know that list of what processing is, we need to have a lawful basis. Uh, so there are different lawful bases that we can choose under Article 6 of GDPR. Uh, so consent of the data subject is one, getting consent from a patient. Uh, sorry, not from a patient, from, from a consumer or, well, or a patient. Uh, processing is necessary for the performance of a contract. Uh, processing is ne necessary for compliance with a legal obligation. Processing is necessary to protect vital interests of a data subject, uh, necessary for the performance of a task carried out in public interest, and necessary for the purpose of legitimate business interests. Except 
where such interests are overridden by the interest rights or freedom of the data subject. So whatever we're doing with the patient's data, we need to have written, um, well, personal data, you need a lawful basis. Uh, for special category data, you need a lawful basis plus a special condition, which is on the next slide. But I'll give you some examples, uh, you know, on, on here. So, for example, uh, processing is necessary compliance with a legal obligation. Uh, there's a bit of a debate and a bit of a grey area over do we really need to get patients' consent to send them um, patient satisfaction surveys? I would actually say that under, and this is a revision we might be making to the code documents, I would actually say that under um, the key lines of inquiry and under the Health and Social Care Act, we have a legal duty to actively seek feedback from patients. So I actually think potentially we're going to revise our documents to say um, that you don't need patient consent to ask them for to do feedback surveys because you could use this lawful basis of compliance with a legal obligation to survey them because you're complying with the Health and Social Care Act and the key lines of inquiry. So hopefully that makes sense. Uh, for our employees, because obviously this all needs to be transparent to our employees because we may have special data on them or personal data on our employees. And if we send them to occupational health as well, we may have uh, sensitive data on them. But uh, processing is, uh, is necessary for, um, oh, sorry, for the performance of a contract. Uh, so you need to process your employees' data in order to maintain the contractual relationship that you have with them. So these are the things that you would write, identify through your process, sorry I hate to use the word process again, but uh, these are the things you, you would identify through your doing the activity of understanding how you collect, how you store, what you're doing with data, what data you have and what processing activities you're doing around that. Uh, and then obviously you put that into your privacy notice along with the lawful basis for those activities. Uh, legitimate interest is an interesting one. I'll come on to that when we're talking about uh, marketing because it, it is a, a grey area and it's, it's subject to debate either way. Uh, so conditions for, uh, for processing special data. So in addition to having something from Article 6, when you're talking about special data, you also need to pick a condition uh, from, uh, to write on your, your privacy notice. Uh, and it says there, in, awful to, in order to lawfully process special category data, you must identify both a lawful basis under Article 6 and a separate condition for processing under special category data, sorry, for processing special category data under Article 9. Now, this is taken directly from the ICO guidance, which was updated very recently. Um, but to give you examples here, you can see, say, the top one there, which is taken from Article 9, uh, the top one says, processing is necessary for the establishment, exercise, or defense of legal claims. So if you look back to, say, the last slide for Article 6, uh, processing is necessary for compliance with a legal obligation, plus processing is necessary for establishment, exercise, defense of legal claims. That's what you could use in your privacy notice for, um, for how you would deal with patient complaints. You don't need to ask a patient's consent to send their full records, all of their special category data, to your defence agency um, because, or Dental Protection or MDDUS or whoever you use, uh, you don't need to ask permission to do that and get consent to do that because you have a lawful basis under those two points. Similarly, on the bottom one, you don't need to, there seem to be some people out there saying, oh, I must get my patient's permission to have clinical records on file for them. Well, obviously, no, we don't because we are dental practices and that's what we do. So under that bottom one, 92H, uh, processing is necessary for the purposes of preventative or occupational medicine. That's what we do. We don't need a patient's consent to hold clinical data on them. So hopefully that makes sense. Mapping your information types and flows. We've given you a document if you are a code member. Obviously, if you're not a code member, then we'll get in touch with you or get in touch with us and we can talk about how you can come on board with iComply and, and, and resolve this stuff really, well, hopefully very, very easily. So. Mapping your information types and flows, you need to understand the types of data, how you collect it, how you hold it, you know, is it, is it through a marketing process, is it through getting someone to fill out a medical history form, is it through your application forms for, for people applying for jobs, those are all ways that you're going to collect personal slash special data as well on how you collect and hold. Sorry, excuse me one second. Identify any company that stores or processes data on your behalf. Under GDPR, 
Uh, all the companies you deal with must be GDPR compliant, essentially. So any company within the EU is pretty much fine because they, they're going to comply with this. Anyone who's outside of the EU is, is more difficult. Uh, if they're in the US, then they're generally subject to what's called the US EU Privacy Shield. So you just want to check if they're sort of within that, but they're, they're pretty much compliant with GDPR. Uh, if they're outside of the EU, um, as data controllers, technically, it's your job to decide whether or not they're GDPR compliant. Uh, and our advice would be that would be a bit of a nightmare to figure out for a non-EU company. And do you really want to look through all of their GDPR compliance in the same way that you're doing all of your own? Because you'd have to look at it to that detail from them. You couldn't just accept a contract because you know, they're not duty bound by those regulations. So if, if someone's outside of the EU and not in the US, EU Privacy Shield, the current code advice is you maybe should use a different company. Um, so you've got to identify companies that store and process data on your behalf. Generally speaking, that's going to be people like your labs, uh, third party IT support, SOE Exact, R4, uh, people along those lines. Um, so there are a load of questions coming up, so we'll, we'll, we'll have a look at that in a second, um, or we'll look at that at the end. So understanding your information flows, I think I covered that before, but obviously it's all the information coming in and out of your practice, how you're managing that. Uh, do you need to, you know, if you're sending stuff on personal mobile phones, should you maybe have a practice mobile phone that doesn't leave the practice? Uh, you know, um, identifying and minimizing your risks. This is all done through this document. It's a really powerful document for this, uh, this M217Q the sensitive information map, PIA and risk assessment. Uh, so, you know, looking at your, your procedures, you know, we've got M217C, which is the information governance procedures, making sure that they're really robust and they cover everything. Making sure you've got logs in place of who's holding what equipment and what software you have, and you're looking at potential, you know, mobile equipment, who has access to that, is it even necessary? Introducing privacy by design. Um, if some of those things aren't necessary, taking them away, introducing encryption, uh, pseudonymization um, and making sure that your flows are as secure as possible. Um, so as I said, members can use M217Q, but that's a really good starting point is to map everything and understand it. Um, so hopefully I've covered that in enough detail. Um, so contract your processors. So as I said, it's taken from the ICO guidance there. Whenever a controller uses a processor, it needs to have a written contract in place. So with your employees, that's generally covered by your contracts. For any third party company, such as your labs, your practice management software, IT support, Dropbox, iCloud, online backup, I should say backup, sorry about the typo there, uh, you'd want to make sure that you've got this model contract in place. The GDPR doesn't say what clauses need to be in, uh, that contract. However, uh, it does say what the spirit of that contract should be and we've obviously translated that into a document that you can use. Um, you do not need to, uh, it's our position at Code is you do not need to have processor agreements in with referral practices. Either people you are referring to or people you are receiving referrals from because technically they're a separate business. You're not acting on each other's behalf. They're not processing data for you. You're not processing data for them. They are just passing a patient onto you and that's then your own business subject to your own compliance. So if you started to do that, I'd recommend you stop. Uh, we don't feel that it's necessary and, and practices that are doing that, it would be, I think it'd be crazy if we all started to have to put these, uh, these in place with all of our referrers. Uh, it would just, it's just taking it a little bit of a step too far, I'd say. So, um, that's sort of the fourth point on that slide there is, you know, you must only appoint a processor who provide sufficient guarantees. So that's where, you know, if you're using anyone who's outside of the EU or out of the US EU privacy shield, that's where it's going to get a bit messy. So marketing and consent. So you are processing personal data in order to perform marketing. That's what you're doing. You're processing a patient's or, a, or somebody's data in order to do marketing. And you must have a lawful basis for doing that. And we've looked at the lawful bases that you can use on a previous slide. We're advising that you use consent for this. Now, why are we advising that and not using legitimate interests if people have been looking into that? Um, one of the main reasons is the e-privacy regulations. Uh, the e-privacy regulations basically state that you should have always already got consent for marketing in a certain way. And 
There is a kind of a bit of a loophole that you can use for direct mail marketing. Um, so direct mail marketing, you could potentially use legitimate interest because it's not covered by the e-privacy regulations. Um, but the e-privacy regulations are quite clear on, on, on what you need to have done in order to effectively have gained consent uh, for uh, those existing patients. And most people are probably not meeting those requirements. So our advice is that you don't do that. If you want any more information on that, then I'd advise you sign up to the Data Protection Network. It's free. Uh, and they've got a one hour legitimate interest webinar on that, which will really explain it to you in, in a really good detail. If you're thinking of using it, our advice is not to, and to just gain consent from your patients to market to them. So hopefully that's clear. I can't go into too much depth on the webinar, uh, but obviously you, our, our, permission, our position is you, you advise, that you use consent as a lawful basis for marketing, and you can adapt our communication consent form in order to do that. Probably putting it in your medical history, or if you, you can use those um, questions if you're sending any mailings out, or if you do any sort of online thing in order to gain that consent. The consent's got to be clear, explicit, and granular. You really need to, to make sure that they know what, what you're doing and why you're doing it, and if possible, have a link to the privacy notice at the same time. You know, they really want to be able to see the privacy notice at the point that you gain consent. Uh, this doesn't mean you need to email it out to all of your patients, as some people are asking. There's no requirement to do that, but you must publish it and people really need to have access to it at the point where they are trying to opt in, as it were. And it has to be opt in and you can't have pre-ticked boxes, you can't have a tick to opt out or anything like that. So hopefully that's, that makes sense. Um, so documenting and publishing. So obviously you've got this internal requirement for accountability, which is to the ICO, and you've got this external one for transparency to your patients. And this is how we deal with it in the code system. So you've got a privacy notice, which I've been through that, but then you also have a data protection and security policy, which explains what you're trying to meet and, and how your, you know, your ethos in trying to get there. Um, where, and your information governance procedures are your step-by-step -step processes of how you're going to do that. So those are quite, uh, those are quite detailed. Um, and as you work through our action plan, you will be updating these documents. So data subject rights, I just wanted to touch on this briefly. So under the GDPR, uh, your data subjects, your patients and your employees have certain rights. Uh, and I just wanna cover the most important ones because uh, we've got a whole list there, but I've starred the ones that I think are really, really important. Number one is the right to be informed. And that is essentially that is, is about privacy notices and transparency. So they have the right to understand exactly what you're going to do with their data, what your justification is for it, and, and that's through the right to be informed. They have a right to access. Now, the reason I've mentioned this here is because uh, this is a big change. Uh, under the Data Protection Act, we had subject access requests. Um, under the, under the data, uh, GDPR, we have uh, the right to access, which is different. And the main changes are you've got to respond to it within 30 days and you can't charge for it anymore. So those are the big impacts. You cannot charge and, and it has to be within 30 days. We are getting people who are ringing us up saying, but can we charge for postage? Uh, our advice at the moment would be no, don't charge for postage either uh, because they have a right to have access to their records and I mean, generally speaking, even prior to GDPR coming in, if someone had asked me, should we charge for postage when someone does a subject access request, I would have said no anyway. Uh, so it's just generally, it's not that big a cost. Obviously, if, you're get, if you were getting them every single month or, or every week, then maybe it was something you need to review. But right now, I, I wouldn't charge for any access under GDPR. Uh, the right to erasure. Um, that's an interesting one. Obviously, you need to log if anybody tries to access, if, everyone, uh, if anyone tries to um, ask to, to enforce this right for themselves, or tries to contact you in order to enact this right, so that's what I was trying to say, then you'd need to log this. But the right to erasure, uh, if you're holding, say, personal identifiable data for marketing purposes for someone who's never been a patient, then they would have a right for erasure because they've never had uh, clinical records with you. Obviously, People can't ask you to delete their clinical records if it's within record retention guidelines. And you know, we, we're in line with NHS guidelines, we would say you know, around up to 10 years. It's quite interesting because what you actually notice is the, the NHS changed their wording from 11 years plus to up to 10 years. So they're kind of bringing it in line with GDPR a little bit. Uh, but you know, up to 10 years or 
for as long as, ne as is necessary. If you think it was a complex case or there were some complaints around it, you might need to retain it for longer than, than 10 years, which is fine, you have a right to do that. So right to erasure may come up. You may have some patients who think they are GDPR savvy trying to ask you to delete all of their clinical records and you might have to say no to them. Uh, the right to object. Um, this is around you know, when you're asking for consent or anything like that, or if you are sending out email marketing and you would need to put in the right, that they have a right to object and they have a way of objecting by clicking on a link. That's basically a, please stop using my data for this purpose. So, uh, so that's your right to object. And, uh, and I think those are the most important ones and the ones I think you're gonna come across. Uh, the other ones I think less so. So, data protection officers. Um, Bit of a bone of contention uh, because GDPR um, defines healthcare bodies. I can't remember the exact definition in GDPR, sorry, but, but essentially the GDPR document from the EU doesn't look like dental practices are, uh, de dental practices are included in, in those uh, institutions that require data protection officers. However, in the draft data protection bill, which is going to become the act, it does look like that's going to happen. Um, so. For private practices, it's discretionary. Unless you're massive, it's probably not going to be a big issue. So we're generally saying private practices don't need to bother uh, with having a DPO. Um, DPOs shouldn't be the practice owner, uh, and they must be able to carry out their duties in an independent manner and not easily coerce, which is why a lot of people are recommending that if you're going to do this, you get an external company. Our position at Code at the moment is more of a wait to see what happens with the Data Protection Act. Um, this could be what, what I would term the next occupational health, uh, if, if, if people understand that. Do we need to send our team members to occupational health has been a grey area for the last eight years. Um, I think with the IG lead, it's going to be some, sorry, with the data protection officer, we'll see what comes out of the wash on this one. So for now, our advice is that your information governance lead, as long as it's not the practice owner, can be your data protection officer, though I would just hold off on any expensive training at this point. So, GD, we were pretty much at the end of the webinar now, just a couple more slides. So GDPR related documents. Now, I have covered uh, the sort of Hopefully you understand what the thinking is behind GDPR, where it's coming from, your basic steps that you need to be doing it. However, we have a whole suite of documents in iComply to help you comply with this stuff. We have documents linking in the uh, information governance toolkit requirements, uh, data protection toolkit now, sorry, requirements with, um, uh, with GDPR and to show how you can match all of this stuff up together for the NHS practices. We have consent forms. We also have... Um, you know, over on the left there, mobile equipment logs and mobile equipment terms and conditions. So if you are issuing laptops or, you know, potential data breach devices to your employees or to uh, dentists, then you can obviously make sure you've got the right things in place now. So you can sign up and you can experience Compliance Nirvana. This is our new advertising comp campaign that's coming out and people are asking, what is Compliance Nirvana? Well, it's that. Uh, it's that moment when you don't need to worry about compliance because you know iComply has got it all in hand and you've got your trusting code and we're helping you manage it and go through it.